this this shows that there was a freedom of movement. They weren't controlled. They weren't locked up. They weren't kidnapped. But they're not including that in the case file. And the second thing they're not including is the WhatsApp messages in terms of the entirety of them. Do these people have an interest in basically going after Andrew Tate? The answer to that is most likely yes. And I'll explain why. Anytime any case goes to trial, even if you're innocent, there's trial risk. And right. the risk is that things can go wrong and you could go to jail. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am uh, going to be doing an interview about Andrew Tate with a, an independent journalist, Salam Ahmed. And uh, he's done probably is one of the most um, well-educated or informed uh, journalists out there about the uh, Andrew Tate and uh, Tristan Tate case. And we're going to do a, an interview and see if we can get some some more facts that are more fact-based and less opinion-based. So check out the interview. Okay, so uh, real quick, if you don't mind, um, right, you're an independent journalist, and you kind of just gave me the, the overview of what your background is, but would you mind doing it kind of again a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, I've got an academic background, um, and so that's the... A basis by which I've been looking at this, analyzing it based on from an academic point of view. I um, also um, have journalistic background, both uh, publicly in terms of this public case, and then I've done a few cases privately as well. Um, and then I write about uh, topical issues, wherever they may be. And um, so that's basically my background. In terms of this specific case, initially when I came into this, I was just completely neutral. Um, I didn't, I don't know the tits. Um, and I've never spoken to the Tates. Um, and even when it comes to just content, it was minimal consumption. So one time I went to my sister's house and she had a video on, and I saw, saw a debate between him and some YouTube, and I was like, oh, he won that debate. And then the second time was when he converted to Islam. I saw I saw the picture, and then I just made a comment. But other than that, there was no other, there was no other interaction. And it's only when he went to prison, uh, there was a plethora of attacks on him. And so when that was, when that happened, I just thought, let me look into this, what's happening. So then as I looked into it, I initially started by demonstrating the weakness of the arguments that people were doing as opposed to looking at the specificities of the case. But then after that, I went into the specifics of the case. But now you just, just for complete disclosure, one would say that I'm more pro tape, but that's only because that's where the evidence has taken me. Okay. So you've, I mean, all right, here's what I'm wondering is, do you, his background, for example, I had done a, a video where I, I talk about how initially he was in England uh, where he started uh, the webcam business. I could be wrong, but I think that's where it, it kind of started. And he had a large house. He had a lot of women that were working out of the house. And one of the women, according to Andrew Tate, basically got intoxicated. He kind of threw her out of the house. She insisted he owed her money. He said, I'm not going to pay you the money. And she eventually filed charges weeks later, from my understanding, filed some charges against him. And then a few months later, the police came and they, according to him, kind of raided his house, spoke with all of the girls. She had said that he, uh, uh, I guess, assaulted her. And the, the other girls that had been there backed up his story and said, that's not what happened at all. Now, that was the first, uh, from my understanding, that was the first problem he really had with the law. Am I wrong about that or? That was the second incident. Second and, incident, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that incident specifically, you're quite right, you ac accurately portrayed it. In addition to that, that was part of the Vice hit piece. And in that one, um, what happened was the CPS dropped it. And the main reason for that was because the C in the United Kingdom at that time, what would happen is whenever there was a rape allegation, the CPS, which is the Crown Prosecution Service in the United, in the US, that's called the best of prosecutor. What he what 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 they do is they look at the evidence both for the case and against the case. So they looked at both aspects of the evidence. But one of the aspects of the evidence that they looked at was that they found voice notes where the two because there's two women they were basically colluding to lie about it. And so because they were colluding, that became a major basis behind which why they dropped the case. All right. So what was the first incident? So the first incident was in 2013. And again, same thing. The CPS saw the text messages 
And in the text messages, the girl says, uh, I consented. So he says, because it's obviously um, basically BDSM and this type of like extreme type liberal behavior that's going on, which ethically is unacceptable from a monotheistic framework. But within Western liberalism, I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey is one of the most sold books of all time. Um, but specifically from that paradigm, um, she actually says, if I consented, you didn't grab me. So that's, that, again, because consent was seen both in text messages and so on and so forth, that wasn't taken forward as well. And, and that was, there was a, a video of him basically having like rough sex with a, a girlfriend. That was a separate incident. So he was never charged for that. That's right. basically his girlfriend. And I think from the information that we have, not think I know he's still friends with her. And so that was basically consensual. And she's come out at least two or three times and said, look, that was completely consensual. And she's come out since he's been arrested and said the arrest is unfair. So she's been a very vocal advocate of him even till this day. So what what were, what were the specifics of the first the first case? Because I've never heard of the, the first case. Yeah, the first case was 2013. It was part of the Vice documentary. Um, again, it was him and some girl. And what had happened was they'd had a relationship. She basically continued the relationship for six months. And six months later, she complained that she'd been uh, taken advantage of six months earlier. And then what had happened was, obviously, they looked at her text messages and voice notes. And in the text messages, she provided consent. So that's that's what the specifics were of that. Okay. And then there then there was a second incident which happened in uh, in uh, London. That's right, 2015. Right, and then that didn't it was work. 2013. Out. Then it was 2015. Okay, and then he went to he moved to uh, Romania. That's right. And he made a lot of really, uh, you know, just it, looking back on it, it seems like really just detrimental comments about how Romanian Romania was uh, corrupt and your money could buy you a long way. And he, I'm sure he said some things that definitely did not, would not have sat well. If I was a Romanian official, I, I wouldn't have wanted him saying those things about, about the country and the police. And so for sure, for sure, for sure, because obviously he's saying these things to try and popularize himself again and make him famous and well-known. Uh, he talks about a lot of things that, you know, like, so look, when, when I give this example, people always think I'm trying to make excuses. But in reality, it's not it's not like that. What it is, is, you know, when you people talk in this manner, you know, this kind of like slang, this kind of like ghetto talk, you know, I'm a, right. I'm a gangster, I'm this, I'm mafia, I paid this person, so on and so forth. We have this quite, oh, quite it's quite common in rap culture as well. And you have to remember that he essentially was born, sorry, he was actually essentially raised, he was born in Chicago, but he was raised in Luton. And Luton essentially from, an American standard is that essentially, especially his area was a council estate, which is a ghetto area. So that's his background. So that doesn't make an excuse for what comments he said, because obviously the judge isn't going to be considering these factors when he when when he's um, deciding or getting annoyed about these type of things. But that's just a factor to see that when someone talks in this manner, that's some of the basis behind it. Obviously, if he has committed that, we don't. Uh, uh, that's a different question. But what we do know is at this moment in the case file. And they've been investigating now for nearly 11 months and held them in, I will get top of Slayer uh, later on, but they've held them for like three months. Nothing, there is nothing in the case file as to regards to fraud, money laundering or bribery. Um. Okay. I, I mean, I think, you know, the problem is you see, I, I, you know, look, it was basically, it's like the TikTok culture shorts, you know, he's trying to get attention. He says things to get himself attention. I see lots of people that do that and, but the people that do it, I, you know, obviously they don't think, they don't think it's going to catch up with them. I, I remember seeing a video where a kid had placed a, a gun, like a nine millimeter, whatever, uh, you know, Beretta or Smith and Wesson. I don't know what it was, but it was an automatic weapon on a, on a drone. I don't know if you ever saw this. I haven't seen this. this was probably seven or eight years ago, like he had figured out how to place it on the drone and how to get it to fire. So he could play with the drone and he was target shooting with the gun on the drone. And I, and 
you know, of course the video goes viral. And I remember watching the video going, I just feel like that's a bad idea. Sure enough, like the ATF comes in and they grab him and they, I, I don't forget what they charged him with. Like, you know, like you've got a flying device that has a, a, a lethal weapon on it. Like he did it because he thought it was cute. He thought it would get a lot of views. He was super proud of himself. He didn't think, like he didn't have a criminal mindset. And I think that's the same problem with Tate is that he, he says these things that he's trying to get attention and he does, he gets attention from young guys, you know, um, that think he's super cool and he says funny things and he says things that, you know, some people think and say, some people think and don't say, but I, I and so he got a lot of attention that I think, you know, but then he moves to, so, but then he, you know, he's also got this webcam, which honestly, you know, in, in Western culture, like it's acceptable, but it's like semi frowned upon like it's okay like that's what you do that's fine but for the most part i'd say 50 60 percent of of uh at least in the u.s people are like you know like wow so it in a very real sense it's 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 like being a part of a you know of a how can i say this like the sex industry well i mean the sex industry is would be illegal but what he's doing is it's it's not illegal. So people are like, it's dicey, but it's legal, but they're not it's kind of frowned upon. So so in regards to that, um it's just two points. First first of all, in terms of online content. So online content, as you said, can be problematic. But how it works is if your online content correlates with what you've been charged with specifically, then that online content content can be used. But if the co online content, he says one thing, but then he's not being charged for that specific thing, then it can't be used. So as an example, let's say someone said, I shot Bill. Right. But Tom is dead. You won't get in trouble, even though you said I shot him. But if Bill is actually dead, then you could then you could get in trouble. That could be used as evidence. So when you look at what he said online and you look at the case file, they both don't correlate. That's the first point. In terms of the second point, you're quite right. I mean, I think when it comes to like this entire industry, cam industry or... For example, and he's not actually in charge for cam industry, but we know he did it. So cam industry, OnlyFans, TikTok, Instagram, all of these industries, modeling, all of these industries which are basically using sexual sexualization uh, as a way of selling is completely against the monotheistic uh, paradigm for sure. But it is actually widely accepted and normal. So for example, the amount of money women are making on Instagram on OnlyFans, on TikTok, when it comes, and it's generally speaking, majority of the time, exploitation of men, it is a lot more acceptable than it than, than one, one realizes. Right. Well, I was going to say, it's funny that you say exploitation of men because women think it's exploitation of women. Like, I mean, from, you, see, you see what I'm saying? Like, I get that a lot where it's like, oh, these guys are exploiting the, these women. Wait a minute. These women are putting themselves out there to be, to charge men, like, these men aren't making them do, they're not forcing them to do this, but you know, it gets twisted. So, like to me, I, I see what you're saying. I feel like, yeah, they're going after guys that will pay them. They want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, for sure. Because if you look at it, uh, um, the ma a man doesn't have the option and that's because men are more visual. So they're willing to pay for these type of things. And the type of ridiculous things that people are paying for is watching a woman drink some drink, watching a woman sleep. Like this is pure ex exploitation because it's essentially men who don't have access, access to women or don't have a happy marriage or happy situation and then they're looking for comfort elsewhere and then they're just getting completely rinsed. Um, so, I mean, it is exploitation. Of, it is There is some exploitation of women. I'm not saying there's not, but it's a significant exploitation of men, especially in, for example, the United States where 30% of under 30-year-olds are not even having relations. You can see that the level of demographic that you basically can appeal to. It's so funny because that's so, like, I'm, I'm 53 years old. Like that is such a so vastly different than the the era that I grew up in. Yeah. Um. So, all right. So Tate moves to uh, he he moves to Romania. Is he is, at this point? He's still running the cam business, or? Yeah, yeah. So he's he he has the cam business in Romania, um, and it seems like from the evidence he did do that for a year or two, but then he moves to and this is what he charged for is actually TikTok. And OnlyFans. Okay. Um, well, 
so he stops doing the cam business or he, I don't know, it just closes down and he just ships his. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, so at some point he's not doing the cam business anymore. I don't know the specific date from right. the record, but there is some point they don't, but this case specifically, they're being charged from 2021, early to mid 2021 till mid 2022, April, 2022. During that period, they were not doing cam business. So it's specifically TikTok and OnlyFans. Right. So he's, but, and he's basically, he started this, uh, the Hustler University. Yeah. That, doing, that's continuing. Okay. The consulting, all of that. And so what was the case? What, what is the case based on that he's actually, uh, yeah. you know, incarcerated for or been awesome. charged? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll just provide a timeline. So he's been charged from, um, April, 2021. Oh, they both are, well, all four of them are. So there's actually four people being charged. There's Andrew Tate, his brother, Tristan Tate. And then two women associates. One is Georgiana and one is Luhana. Now, in terms of um, this specific case, what they've been charged for is from around early 2021 until um, April 2022. Now, in April 2022, the house was raided. And what you've got is the people, uh, so the house was raided. But who's actually been charged? According to Descartes, which is essentially the equivalent to maybe the UK, US FBI or the UK Metropolitan Police. So according to their press release, there's six women who are alleged victims. Um, two of them women have already come out and said, we're not victims. You guys have accused us of being victims. I will talk more in detail about that. But basically, you guys have accused us of being we're victims, but we're not victims. Two of the women we know nothing about, and it's quite possible that they don't exist in the sense of there's no information about them in the case files about up to now what's been released. It is possible there's two more, but there's nothing about them. But two women are the main women that this whole case is based on. One is a woman from the United States who went to Romania for five to six days. And the second woman is from the United Kingdom of Moldovan background. And she was there for um, about two months. So that's what the entire case, uh, that, that's the main basis of the case. That's the the basis of what the um the human trafficking part. Human trafficking and there's two this human trafficking allegations and a, a link to the human trafficking allegations is the criminal enterprise because they say that through this criminal enterprise, human trafficking occurred and the people part of the criminal enterprise is the four people I mentioned, and then the second thing is that there's two accounts of grape allegations by the uh, United Kingdom woman. All right, what. What did that? Okay, it's my understanding. I could be completely wrong. Is that this all stemmed from an event where there was uh, one of the women were at was at his house for a party or something, and she was texting with her boyfriend. This is I heard this from Tate from an Andrew Tate video where he said she was at his house. Her boyfriend or ex boyfriend was te was texting her, and she said, "I'm at Andrew Tate's house." I can't leave. And then she stopped texting him. And then he, that he contacted the U.S. Embassy. U.S. Embassy contacted the police. The police came and arrested he and his brother and then kept them downtown for a few hours, questioned them, and then dropped the dropped everything, let him go. And it's because yeah. it turned out she was not being held uh, uh, captive. Like the boyfriend was saying, hey, she's being held captive against her will. Is that right or... So that there's three accounts, and I'll, I'll tell you all three. So that's okay. Andrew Tate's version, right? And then you have the um, the version of the girls, which is that they the girl claimed that what happened was she was held against her will. She then had no access to any kind of phones or any way of contacting anyone, and allegedly her brother, who was part of the military, she she sent him a code word, and when she sent him a code word, he contacted the embassy. And then let her out. So okay. that's her version of events. So it's you, not, she didn't contact the boyfriend. She contacted her brother. Well, according to her version, there was no boyfriend. Okay. Okay. And then, from what I've what I've what I've seen in terms of the information, in terms of the leaks, um, first of all, um, the woman's story um, has a significant holes in it because um, she's a, she's actually an only child. So that's actually she couldn't have told her brother because she's an only child. Uh, and the second thing is um, it was actually her mother who contacted the embassy. That happened for sure because she was readily texting her mother throughout. 
So she had access to her phone. She had access to communication. Um, now, Tate's story is possible because, again, according to my um, what I've uncovered, she did actually have a boyfriend at that time. Um, so that is plausible that two people may have contacted the embassy. But for definite, we know the mother contacted. So basically what I'm saying is we know the mother had contacted. There's a possibility that uh, Andrew Tate's story is right, but it's not right that the woman's version is completely um, doesn't meet the evidence. Okay. And, and was it was there a thing? Uh, was there some kind of a video where they actually show saw her go outside the gate and pick up pizza or something and come back? Or is that? A... Oh yeah, sure. So let's let's specifically talk about the allegations. So basically, you have the U.S. woman who claims that she was part of human trafficking. So human trafficking, there's there's a number number of things that need to be met to be trafficked. You know, the first one, of the main things is this: that you were basically controlled, you were coerced, and you didn't have freedom of movement. Now, freedom of movement means that you're basically not allowed to go out anywhere. Um, and, you know, for example, that can be done by taking away your passports. It can be done by taking away your phone. It can be done by making sure you don't have access or communication to the world. It can be done out of fear. So if she thinks that just by, even if she has a phone, but she thinks, you know what, by communicating, I'm going to get in trouble, that would, that would again fall into that category. Um, so from the leaks that we've had, including one of the more you mentioned where the woman was going out and, and getting the pizza, but there's also been text messages leaks. And in the text message leaks, it clearly says it shows that the women women were basically free to phone and she was calling and texting her mom regularly. They, she, uh, they, they had freedom, they, did, they had their passports because she actually booked tickets to return to the, uh, sorry, to go to United Kingdom. So even though she's from the US, the text messages show that she was communicating with her mom and said, I want to move to London. And you can see that's a big psychological basis behind behind why she made this whole story up, because she was sent just trying to convince her mum based on her previous background. And look, let me go to London. Let me go to London. But anyway, she booked the tickets to go to London. In addition to that, she mentions a number of times that Tristan Tate doesn't care that if I leave, they're not bothered about me. They don't really care. They don't care what I'm doing. They don't care what I do. So all of these demonstrate a lack of. Um, it doesn't meet the standards of a uh, of uh, human trafficking. The second bit is fraud. Again, you, it doesn't mean it because there was no, um, she didn't actually ever did do OnlyFans or TikTok or any of these things. So she was only there for six days, five to six days. And during them five or six days, the Tates weren't actually in Romania for that entire period as well. So you just think about the level of minimal interaction there was between this girl and the Tates. It was quite low. And um, so that's the basis of her, uh, her claim. The other girl, she was there for two months. But again, same thing. She had access to all of the same things. She had access to the same situation and she was able to, again, book her flight to go to the United Kingdom. There's more details about them girls as well in terms of background, but I can go to them when you, when you, when you want. Well, okay. So those are two separate girls than the ones that said where the police came and raided the house and took them and then released them. You're talking about two separate. You're talking about... No, no. So, so, so what happened was these girls, the two I mentioned... As well as two more, when the police raided in April, they took yeah, that's, the girl. That's in. the most recent raid. No, the one in April. Okay. So this case is the same case. So what happened was they br they basically raided the house in April. They let the girls, you know, the girls disappeared. They let the Tates out after 24 hours. And then eight months later, they brought, they arrested the Tates again for the same issue. Okay. Just, okay. Just make it. All right. Yeah. I didn't understand that. Um, all right, so what were they doing this whole time? Like, what's what's been going on? Like, why why would the investigation take that long? Well, again, that's hugely problematic, and I th and I think that, I mean it's the reason for that is this that there's actually not much evidence. The entirety of the evidence is actually the witness statement of these girls. When you look at the actual evidence, it doesn't corroborate a human trafficking. So you're basically left with just the word of these girls, and that's why. And oh, sorry, you got the word of these girls, and you've got a psychological report. So what happened was, after the, after the raid happened in April, the two girls, again the US UK woman, women, sorry, they went to a psychiatrist uh, to get a psycho uh, to get a report. This wasn't a court appointed one, but they went to them, they went to her, and then they got a a, a, a psych report. Now the problem with the psych report is this: they based it solely on what the girls told them. But more, what's worse than this, and this was shocking for me, is based on this psych report, they've determined that the other girls are, are, are brainwashed. So without ever speaking to girl number three, girl number four, girl number five, girl number six, 
all of the other women who are basically saying none of this is accurate, they're saying all of them women are brainwashed. But then the basis of that uh, uh, hypothesis or the basis of that deduction is on the two girls who spoke to the psychiatrist. But the, those two girls haven't changed their story. The um, so, so we don't know if they've changed their story. So do you mean from the witness statement? Yes, from the original yeah. witness statement. Well, we don't know because they've not nothing. Nothing's come out. But what we do know is, based on what they've told us in terms of the, what the example I gave, that didn't corroborate with the WhatsApp uh, leaks that had happened from their side. Okay. So, but then two of the women that the that the police are saying are victims have come out and said we're not victims. They're claiming we're victims, but we're not. Yeah, yeah. They're claiming we're victims, and we're not. We see the Tates' family, and I actually interviewed one of the women, um, and. Without exaggeration, she was like very bubbly, very extrovert, very in, you know enthusiastic. She was talking about issues that weren't even relevant to the case, showing that like you know sometimes you know when, when you can basically when you could brainwash someone or make some or prepare someone for an interview. But then she was talking about issues that were completely unrelated to the case. So it showed me like in my view from interviewing her, she had autonomy, she had um, strength of character. And it was actually, it's actually shocking for me that basically they can say that these women are so weak that they can be brainwashed. And, and what about the other two women? Are there any, are there any witness, are there any statements from them or are they just listed them? They haven't even listed them. They just said there were six. T Andrew Tate's lawyer said there's not six, there's less. So we're kind of in a, in, in a kind of dark situation that we don't know anything about them. So they may or may not exist. All right. Um, I saw something. So. So they've held them. They've extended it twice now. That's right. Yeah, they've. Uh, they've so basically, how it works in Romania is, which is a hugely problematic in my view, even though it does follow their own legal system. You have a scenario where you can basically arrest someone for 180 days without ever charging them or prosecuting them. So what's happened is they basically arrested them for 30 days. And then you're allowed to basically apply for an extension of 30 days each time. So now the extension's up to, for the up, it'll be 90 days by the end of this next, next to here, as a result of this previous hearing. So they've been held for 90 days. And that's usually problematic because look, you can arrest, imagine to arresting someone, taking away their liberty, taking, taking away their freedom, which is huge, without having the evidence to prosecute and convict. And the judge actually said, look, the level of evidence we have is based on reasonable suspicion. So reasonable suspicion, the bar is very low. Like, it's just right. suspicion. This is in Romania. And so just think about that. It's lower than even in a civil case. So in a civil case, it'll be balance of probabilities. And for a criminal case, it's beyond reasonable doubt. So they need to take the level of evidence from reasonable suspicion all the way up to beyond reasonable doubt. And so they've been looking for, as you said, from April till December, so eight months, Plus these three months that they've held them for, for 11 months, and they've still not been able to find the evidence to bridge that gap. All they have is these two, the, the two women and the and the psychi uh, psychological report. That's right. Thus far. Thus far, yeah. And the ev obviously, they, they, they believe that they've got the evidence, but when we've seen the evidence from the leaks perspective, they haven't, meet the, they haven't met the standards. And so even the judge said, the judge said, look, what you're giving me now isn't enough to prosecute and convict, so you need to find me the evidence. And then that's another problem. So again, part of what they do in Romania is when they increase the increments from every 30 days, what's meant to happen is the prosecutor's meant to provide new evidence to show that, look, you've kept, I've kept him for 30 days, but look, I found something new, so let us keep him for another 30 days. In the two hearings, new evidence wasn't presented. So again, we don't, again, it, it's, it's highly problematic in terms of um, them being held you know, even, by their, uh, even by their own standards, they shouldn't have been able to extend the 30 days. For sure, for sure. And then in addition to that, they, they were just, again, the, these, this point I'm going to say is within their standards, but again, it just showed like underhanded tactics. Um, in the first hearing, they, did not, they, they didn't give um, the, the Tate's lawyer the case files until 45 minutes before the hearing. And even then they showed them the, showed them the case file and they took it back off them. And then in the second hearing, they gave them 17,000 pages of documents one day before the hearing. Now, that is allowed within Romania, but it was, again, just kind of like underhanded tactics. But what has been contravention of Romanian law 
is the fact that this, and this is another hugely problematic thing. So, you know, when we were discussing the British case, we talked about the CPS, how the CPS looks at the information and looks at both the positive information and the negative information. And then based on that, makes a deduction, look, is this case strong enough to prosecute or convict? And if it is, then they'll take it to trial. And if it's not, they'll drop it. Here, what's happened is they've not included the evidence that provides, that helps the Tate's case. So as an example, the Tate's want to put in the CCTV footage because in the Tate's house, there was external CCTV as well as internal CCTV, as well as in the other house where the girls were staying, which was one kilometer away, was external CCTV. Um, and I'm not sure about internal, but there was definitely external CCTV. So they want to include that to demonstrate, look, this this shows that there was a freedom of movement. They weren't controlled. They weren't locked up. They weren't kidnapped. But they're not including that in the case file. And the second thing they're not including is the WhatsApp messages in terms of the entirety of them. So they're just examples of certain evidences that are not being included, but should be because it contravenes, for example, Article 5 of Romanian Penal Code at, and then a, a number of other articles. So I don't want to bore your, bore your listeners who are um, citing them, but basically. So that's an example of where this problems occurring. He's been known to cure insecurity just with his laugh. His organ donation card lists his charisma. His smile is so contagious. Vaccines have been created for it. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Okay, so have they, I heard something, and I don't know that this is true, it's just I just heard it, uh, that they were they they were seizing his property or his vehicles or something along those lines, and, and I had heard that, but I didn't, I haven't seen anything, and I didn't, I really only heard it from one source, so I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, that is true. They have seized their cars, they've seized their, their land, their properties, uh, their assets, in, uh, I mean, like watches, expensive watches and so on and so forth, Bitcoin uh, purses. So they've, they have seized a number of assets. And again, uh, the main argument that the defense has is that it was, it's been completely disproportionate. Uh, so, the, so based on what this case involves from a financial perspective, there have been two women who worked for a very minimal period of time. And the financial aspect doesn't meet the level of uh, assets that they've taken. So the assets they've taken have been uh, or, or, or both, or around three and a half to five million. So you, so okay, but you're you're not even. What what fraud? There's fraud allegations. There's charges. But what evidence is there that there was fraud at all? And that you, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, there's no there's no allegations of fraud right now. There's no allegations of money laundering. There was a newspaper report that said, guess what? They investigated that. But since that newspaper report, there's been two hearings as well as two appeals and no evidence or information or charges or uh, information has been brought forth by the prosecutor in terms of financial crimes. Now, on what basis are they seizing all of his assets? So the basis is that it's a criminal enterprise. So the money that they procured uh, from this only fan and TikTok business, they're saying that it meets that requirement. So my... I, I mean, I agree that you kind of see some assets, but what's been seized is completely disproportionate. There's no way he's making five million pounds from TikTok or OnlyFans from with from two women, or even six women. So, what do you think the what do you think the issue is here? Like, why why do you think that they went after them? I mean, they're holding them. They have they have very little evidence. So, what do you what what is your your opinion? on why this has happened. I mean, you've got two women that have allegations that don't quite hold up. Why put together an entire case and grab these guys? And then they had to know the media attention was going to be outraged. Like, what is their goal? Why do it? And what is the ultimate goal? Yeah, so um, in terms of the two women as well, their background is completely um, problematic. And when and, and one thing one should always look at is the credibility of a witness and their credibility is horrendous. Obviously, I'm going to bring that out in the future, but um, one of the women, we already have that information. She uh, was a stripper in the United Kingdom. So again, she was in the sex industry already uh, from a physical perspective. 
She allegedly approached Andrew Tate and said, I want to be a TikTok star. I want to be famous. They went to Romania together. Um, and then allegedly, this is according to Andrew Tate now, so let's, it's important to note that. But according to Andrew Tate, that she basically um, was pro do, uh, conducted, in, she did conduct in prostitution, and then hence why he's wanted to split with her. He, she, then she tried to extort him for £200,000, and then when 200,000 euros, and then when he said no is when, when she brought the charges forth. In terms of the, I'll talk about the grape allegations as well later, but you know, I just want to answer your question. So in terms of your question, there's two possibilities, and I'll, I'll explain what I think, but I think the other possibility, even even though it's not my position, does have some kind of merit to it. So my position is that I don't think it's some kind of like international conspiracy. I think it's completely Romania doing it on their own, thinking that they're making a move to allow them to get to, to get credit in the international stage. And that's the reason they botched this, because I, I believe that if the United States, the United Kingdom were involved, they would have made sure they had the evidence, the data in place before they went for such high profile figures. But that's my opinion on this matter. Others believe that, no, um, it's actually like an international conspiracy. The United States and the UK are involved. They've pushed it. And we know the United States have strong um, control over Eastern European and more weaker governments. Uh, and even stronger ones as well. For example, we know the case of uh, Kim.com in New Zealand where the United States put significant pressure on New Zealand to make sure that he's based, and he's been terrorized for like 10 years. Yeah. Um, so, and then Eastern Europe, we know, for example, United States connections to Albania and the judiciary there. So in terms of Romania specifically, there is that possibility. I'm not discounting it, but that's not my position. I heard this guy, this guy was on TikTok. I mean, <laughs> what? Yeah, like this guy's a, a a TikTok celebrity who irritated some people, and I I just can't I I you know the like the whole international I you know I listen one of the things I loved by the way was in the middle of him being arrested he said the Matrix is attacking me yeah <laughs> I thought wow like he is really really he's all in like yeah. he is absolutely. He didn't drop. So he didn't drop it for a minute. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, look, look from the Matrix point of view, like these guys might call it the Matrix. The way I I see it is the mainstream media, uh, the military industrial complex, and the deep state. Now, do these people have an interest in basically going after Andrew Tate? The answer to that is most likely yes, and I'll explain why. So, in the United Kingdom, so I can give the United Kingdom's example and the United States. So, so for example. In these countries, United Kingdom and United States, or in the world, the most important demographic are children. They care about what your children learn. They care about what your children think. They care about what your children's ideology is. And they care about their belief. Anyone who tries to impact on that, they will go after them. Because they have an unholy alliance with the music industry, with Hollywood, where they allow them to impact your children in the way that you want to. And hence why they could put pressure on the government, as I mentioned in the Kim.com case, to go after New Zealand to yield to their, their demands. Now, with Andrew Tate, he has had a significant impact on the youth to the extent that in the United Kingdom, there is a policy that if someone mentions Andrew Tate, he goes to safeguarding. And if he goes to safeguarding, he can go to prevent. And if it does, you can lose your children. And similarly, there's a number of newspaper reports that in the United States as well, it's banned for teachers to talk about Andrew Tate. So this is somebody where the governments, where society in schooling have made a considerable amount of effort to make sure that he's banned. This didn't happen for like Donald Trump or, or any other kind of like controversial figures. So there is this fear that he is impacting society, both from a cultural point of view. So for example, his view about the roles of men and women in terms of his impact on, on, on youngsters. And you see that. So I do think and believe that I mean, what when they call it matrix, it does sound funny, but when you look at it from the media point of view or from a societal point of view, there is a concern. And then you see that with the case as well. So this is not a conspiracy. So because I've been I've been looking into this in detail, um, one hundred percent of all media articles are against it. Like no one allows any kind of pro Tate article. I wrote a I wrote a newspaper article which was pro Tate. It was published by a newspaper, and then within two days due to the onslaught of abuse that the paper got, they they removed the paper from, from it after they got the million, million or so hits. So there is 
a complete focus on banning this guy. And you know, before he was cancelled, he wasn't just banned, banned, banned from social media, so Instagram, TikTok, these type of things. But he was also at the exact same time, almost in all in conjunction with each other, which which I found shocking when I looked into this. He was banned by Uber. He was a, a, a banned by like um um you know hon, uh, hotel apps. Uh, he was banned by all uh, banking apps all at, within within a space of like 24, 48 hours. So how does that happen where all of these industries ban him in un, not connected within such a short period of time? Yeah, that's it. When I heard that, that like they were closing his bank accounts and things like that, I was like, that that's insane. Yeah. Like, I, I can't imagine that you can you're saying I can't have access to banking. Exactly. Yeah. So, so when you say Matrix, obviously Matrix sounds funny because we, we all grew up with a money m- movie. But yeah. What you can say is the deep state or the mainstream media. Which, which is funny because, you know, when we when I hear the deep state, right, like even when I hear Trump say it, you know, it seems very uh, conspiratorial, like, come on, there's not some group out there. It's like they have meetings. They all have meetings in Switzerland and get together and decide that. But the, but when you look at something like this, it's almost like, I don't know, like there's something's going on. These multiple different platforms and companies got together and like you said, within 48 hours, hammered this guy across the board. It, it, you know, it, it reminds me of, I have I have a buddy who, that I, I, I've done some videos with and he and I were locked up together, right? I was incarcerated with him. He was in there for, um, uh, for basically for tax fraud. And he used to constantly talk about aliens. There's aliens, there's UFOs. And I used to constantly mock him. I'm like, stop it. Why would aliens be interested? Why would aliens come all the way across the galaxy to come and look at our little planet? And, you know, like... He would say, well, they want water. I'm like, water is abundant in the universe. They don't need our water. Well, they um, oh, they, they, they want our planet. I'm like, really? Because honestly, or, or they want energy. They want, I'm like, well, if they travel the cost of galaxy, I'm pretty sure they've got energy taken care of. Well, they want our planet. I'm pretty sure they could terraform any world they wanted if they had that kind of technology. So it was like, stop it. There's just ridiculous. There's no alien. Like, is there alien life? Sure, I believe that mathematically, it's definitely, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute. But are they interested in us? Of course not. And then the U.S. Navy releases these tapes that show these show these little alien ships. And then there's multiple reports of it now. And now I'm like, I mean, I was mocking this guy for years. And now, like, the government admits, listen, there's UFOs. Like, we don't know what they are. So I'm I'm not too sure about aliens because um I was I did read a few books on it and Edward and you know Edward Snowden who was working yeah. at NSA he had deep access to a lot of uh, uh, intelligence and he said he never saw much any any information as regards to that but I guess I, 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 that that's just some, that's my position on that but in terms of deep state involvement we have significant amount of evidence you just saw it now in terms of the Twitter files right it being released that basically they were never mind Andrew Tate they were basically caring about accounts which were even much less impactful, making sure that they were ended, making sure that they controlled what, what you thought, what you believed. We know the deep state involvement, again, with Facebook, with these different organizations. Zuckerberg basically said that he was told told by the, basically, FBI and CIA not to right. release the Hunter Biden um, laptop stories. And then in addition to that, you have a, a scenario where you've got the uh, these, these exact organizations which are deciding war, you know, for example, there's a un- unholy alliance between the military industrial complex, the government, and so on and so forth. So these are like conspiracy theories. These are just like, these are known, but we just accept it and allow like deep surveillance of ourselves. Listen, uh, up to five or ten years ago, they definitely sounded like conspiracy theories. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, In the right. last few years, there have been so many things that have come out that things that I used to take for granted is like, oh, these that's like those guys are crackpot. That's not true. Now that's what I'm saying. Now these things are coming out and you're like, this is incredible. And as far as the alien thing, it you you should look into it. It's a ama- they have these multiple pilots from the uh the navy who they have them on they have them on film where they have these little there's there's all kinds of reports now. If you look into it, you'll you will really be shocked. And, and the Pentagon has come out and said, "Look, there are UFOs. These we don't know what these things were." 
Like they're, they've they come out over and over again and said, look, we're yes, we don't know what these objects are. They're, they're UFOs. Do we believe they're from this, from or from our from our planet they, they're like we have no idea like we don't we think they're i think they call them otherworldly but we have no idea you should look into it you'll be shocked because i was shocked and i also had to go back to my buddy and say listen maybe i don't know maybe but it's the same thing like you said with the with the twitter files with all of these things that what i love is all the people that are out there that were saying this wasn't happening that's not happening that's not true it's not happening you're delusional and then they come out and it's like, wow, you you weren't delusional. You were right. It, it's 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 a frightening world, and I can't imagine being in in uh, Andrew Tate's. You know, he's in another country. He's in what I'm. I can imagine is probably not a great place to be held. Yeah. Um. God, they're seizing his property. Yeah. It it, it it's really it's outrageous. So, what? So what? What? Any? Uh, what else do you? Or anything else you have? Yeah, yeah. So there's um, uh, also the issue of the allegations of grip. So with uh, with one of the women, which is the one from the United Kingdom, she made the allegations three weeks after. So she made an initial report, and it didn't have it in there. And then she made another report a few weeks later. And then she made the allegations. And in the allegation of it happening, one of the incidents she says she doesn't remember when it happened. And the first incident, it was actually, what happened was there was her as well as two other women involved. So it was basically an orgy. Um, and so everyone's saying that they all consented, but then after the fact, she's claiming that she didn't consent. Yeah, that's hard. To, yeah. That's a hard sell. Yeah. Um, I think the problem with, in the U.S. anyway, is I know guys that have been found guilty of rape just by the girl saying he raped me. And that's it. They get on the stand and you say that's not what happened. The girl said that is. But typically those are those are allegations that were made very quickly within the next day, within a few hours, that sort of thing. So, so I prefer look any look, any woman who's been through this, like my heart goes out to them, they should complain straight away and that's the best way to go. I have go about it. I have a problem with people who basically wait weeks, months, years, uh, to try and complain about someone. I think that's hugely problematic. I accept that, look, we can't be in a scenario where we don't believe any woman, and we right. can't be in a scenario where we believe all women, but right. unfortunately, we're starting to move to a world where we believe all women, and that type of society is problematic because it, it, it should not be acceptable. Now, if a woman was to complain very early on, the chances of her case being accepted is a lot higher, and that we accept that because what we what I don't want is the evidentiary threshold to be reduced because as soon as you do that, you're causing problems in the world. You can take any man, man out. I mean, just look at this case. You've got two women who basically are saying we weren't groomed, we weren't brainwashed, we love this guy, we care for him as family, and yet they're saying, you know what, we don't care what you got to say, they're guilty. So imagine that. Imagine I'm going to take you out. I'll say, you know what, you raped this woman, and you said, no, 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 I didn't do it, and then the woman says you didn't do it, and I'm like, it doesn't matter, she's brainwashed, and that's it, you're in prison. Yes. What is the what are the chances that because at some point there would be a trial in the U.S. There's a trial by like a jury. Do they have a jury trials there? Yes, uh, as far as I know, they do have jury tri trials here as well in Romania, as well as they have uh, trials based on uh, on judges doing it as well. In the U.K., it's slightly different. U.K. criminal cases are with a jury, whereas civil cases aren't, unless you make a special application. The issue I have with this is. It shouldn't go to trial because, I mean, you, you'll know better than a lot of people because you've experienced it. But it's, in reality, look, we know anytime any case goes to trial, even if you're innocent, there's trial risk. And right. the risk is that things will go wrong and you could go to jail. It's the reason why the entire fabric of Western culture, except for a few aberrations, which is a problematic in terms of the terrorism act and the Patri Patriot Act. But other than those, the entire concept of Western culture is this. We are not going to charge you. We are not going to uh, um, uh, charge you unless we have the evidence to do so. And only then will you have to go to trial and then fight for your innocence. So innocent until proven guilty. And that is the entire fabric of United Kingdom and the UK structure. And that's the way it should be because you can't take someone's liberty away and then look for the evidence. 
and then take something to trial and hope that something comes up. I think that's who who did it probably right. All right. I mean, I, I, I agree. First, first I, I agree because a, a judge should be able to say, should be able to determine what, you know, what the legal standard is for, for evidence. And if there's enough evidence, because the problem is, and I've said this over and over again, is like, listen, if you're guilty, you need to take a plea. And if you're not guilty, you still have about a 50% chance of being found guilty. So the, I know guys that are, have taken, have taken pleas, even though they were on the fence. Like, I really don't think what I did was wrong, but I took I took a plea because the truth is my lawyer was like, listen, they're going to get five people on the stand. They're going to say this and this and this, and there's a good chance you end up getting found guilty. And then they're re then you're really looking at a sentence where if you take the plea, you're getting a sm much smaller sentence. Um, so totally agree. Yeah. I, I, you know, it, and it's terrifying. It's a terrifying prospect. Uh, and listen, uh, prosecutors are, are just amazing at being able to twist the facts just enough. And the truth is, matter of fact, I mentioned this on a podcast the other day. Do you know what Wadir is? It's it's the process of picking a jury. Yeah. So I had a friend that went to trial. And they went through like 100 people, 150 people trying to get a jury. And one of the questions they ask, of course, each each time they bring jurors in, they ask them, do you feel you can find this person not guilty if they don't have the evidence? And one guy, they got, they were going around. Everybody's like, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yes. One guy said, said, well, I'm not sure. And they go, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, they convicted of, or they indicted him on 45 counts of, of wire fraud. He did something. Yeah. And that's the problem. If you're sitting in that chair, and you've been indicted, a lot of jurors think he had to do something. 100%. You know, and, and unfortunately, it's so easy to indict someone. And in, in this instance, it's easy, apparently, in, in Romania, just to throw you into jail and then kind of start looking for the evidence. But you know what you said is so important, and I, I just really enjoyed what you said because you really laid out the point I was trying to make and made it a lot more accessible to people. What you said is actually the huge problem with trial risk and even within, when you look at, so, you know, social media, mainstream media, a lot of people, when you say to them, look, there's no evidence, they say what you said, there has to be smoke. There can't be no smoke without fire. So they have people, whether subconsciously or consciously have this idea and hence why it's not fair to go to trial unless you have strong enough evidence. I just completely agree with what you said. Yeah. Li listen, I think the other jurors, they all believe that they just exactly. didn't say it. They knew what the appropriate thing to say, you know? was that, oh, no, I could find him not guilty. But the truth is, you he's sitting there, just sitting there, you look guilty. Um, yeah. Yeah, I. so you're saying, obviously, you don't think that it should go to trial. and But if it does, is their system set up in such a way that, that you know, a jurors are going to be able to look at the evidence and make a, a logical conclusion? Or do you, like, I, like, to me, look, you're saying they can't find any evidence. It, at least their system isn't so corrupt that they're manufacturing evidence at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they've not manufactured any evidence up to now from what, from what I know, so we can't assume that they're going to. Obviously, there is people who have that fear that basically they've kept them in for three months now without, without charging them and another three months, that the concern is that they're going to look bad and so therefore they might start doing these type of things. Right, That's the they're going to get frustrated. Yeah, yeah, that's the concern of others. Myself, up to now, I have to say that they've not manufactured anything. Any kind of leak that's happened has been a legitimate leak. It has been from the evidence, albeit some of the leaks have been snippets as opposed to whole context ones, but they have, they've not manufactured anything. Yeah, listen, I've, I've seen I've seen cases in the United States where we're talking about United States, uh, United, they're assistant, assistant U.S. attorneys is what they're called, but, you know, United States prosecutors have gotten frustrated in a case and manufactured evidence. You know, yeah, yeah. They, this is a high-profile case. Just think about this. This is like the biggest case probably in Romania. Romania is in the sense of not in terms of within Romania, but in the fact that Romania, the whole world's eyes are now on Romania because of this. There's a huge amount of pressure to to do something, and that's a, that should be another point of concern as well. Yeah, I mean, it's too bad. You know, the, the problem is a lot of people will, that they'll be placing that pressure. They will go ahead and start manufacturing stuff something instead of kind of saying hey look we tried it didn't work out like the best bet is to say is to cut bait you know they say you know you cut bait like you cut bait and you walk away right yeah instead of digging in 
but who knows? I mean, people will respect the Romanian system, to be honest, if they held the guys now and then they said, look, we followed our legal procedure. There wasn't enough evidence and we didn't take right. it forward. They'll respect them a lot more because what's going to happen is when it goes to trial, there'll be reporters there and they'll be reporting what's happening. And so it's not going to look good for them if they don't have the evidence. Okay. Um, do you have anything else you can, uh, you know, that you... Um, yeah. So in terms of other things that have happened in the case is, for example, um, you know, Tina Glandian from the United States, she became... Uh, so she's part of uh, Mark uh, Gergos. Have you heard of him? The Michael Jackson's lawyer. Oh, okay. Part his, yeah, part of his firm. So Tina Glandian's the one who uh, who basically uh, was the lawyer for uh, Jossie Smollier. Okay. Yeah, uh, I can never say his name right because I always have uh, Dave Chappelle's uh, version where he's a like, Jose Smollier. But anyway, um, basically she was representing him in his case. Um, she's done a really good job. Uh, her main concern is that she's not had access to the clients. So even though she's the counsel, they've not allowed her to have access to uh, the Tate, even though she's made multiple applications. So that's a point of concern. Wait, his, his attorney isn't able to, their, their attorneys aren't able to talk to them? So they have a Romanian attorney and they've been able to talk to them. But Tina Glandian is an attorney from the United States because they're U.S. citizens. Um, and she can basically represent them in terms of from a holistic point of view, as well as guide the attorney. So she can she can do everything except stand in front of the court, essentially. And um, so so there is a huge problem why they're not allowed to see her, because what's happened is as part of the leaks is, you know, when they've been talking to the attorneys, which is privileged, as you know, uh, they've, re they've released that to the public as well. Um, I, I would say though those are the main things. Obviously, there's like minutiae, which, uh, and like for example, the women we we we, we touched on that. That basically, both have very very problematic backgrounds. The one from USA, I'm not privy to say uh, to mention the details, but her background is really really bad. Like once that comes out, I think it'll be hard to believe her as a witness or believe anything that she said in this case. And she was only there for five days. And my opinion is that she's the one who influenced the other the woman to like make these allegations um and in terms of what happened was these women after they made the uh, after the raid happened in april only a few weeks later they went to like a very expensive luxurious holiday to the french riviera which anybody knows is like very very expensive and so the question then becomes like where did they get the money from if they had the money themselves means they were getting paid quite well and so again it, it defeats the argument of human trafficking and if they didn't have the money themselves, then the question is, where do they get, do they get the money from? So, you know, what's funny is let's assume that there's there there is some kind of a a, a cabal uh, yeah. behind the the whole thing. Like this is almost like the worst thing they could possibly do because if he does get released, it really is just going to make him more popular. Oh, he's more popular now, don't you think? Like even oh, yeah. since there's an arrest, like right. That's what I'm saying. Then you've beaten the system. Yeah. The system came at you. They, you fought the system. You beat the system, and now you're back, and you're back. You're back on all the social platforms. Guys, people will go be going crazy. Like all you've done is is legitimize everything you were trying to 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 tear down. I agree. Uh, I agree. So I, I think it'd be a major mistake. I, I so I just wonder. Listen, I'm super curious to know what happened. Unfortunately, my curiosity is based on another person's, you know, suffering. But I mean, it is interesting. People are finding it's news, isn't it? It is newsworthy. I mean, people are interested in social media as well as mainstream media. There's articles coming out every day about the minutia of things. I think in one of a uh, one of the Twitter posts, and um, whoever's doing his handle was basically saying something about seeing ghosts, and then that was all over mainstream media. So there is a significant amount of interest when it comes to Andrew Tate. But there is a significant amount of concern as well. Like I mentioned, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, there's a significant amount of articles coming out which are anti tate There was someone from the New York Post who contacted me. And he said, look, you've been researching the case. Can you answer some questions? So I said, sure. So he gave me a number of questions to answer. I answered them. But within the question, he said, you know, I've got some questions about the self-proclaimed misogynist, Andrew Tate. And then I said, look, what's your what's your point of reference for, for this point? Right. And he said... And so he sent me the reference and it was to a BBC article. And I said, look, that's not a primary source. Can you send me a primary source? He then sent me a pri what he thought was a primary source, which was the podcast. And I listened to the podcast and the irony was it, he actually said the opposite. He said, 
you guys call me a misogynist because you guys are sheep, you're drones, you listen to what the media says, but I'm not a misogynist. And I said, this literally says the opposite of what your claim is. So in the end, he changed his whole article and he made it about Andrew Tate's effects on, on the youth. But that's the level of determination to take him out. So there is there is this kind of a significant determination. And what you know is when the mainstream media work together to try and basically take a guy out, then there's huge problems. We saw that with the BBC. So with the BBC, they, wrote, uh, they did a documentary about him. I went through the documentary. I analyzed it. I presented the flaws in the arguments, uh, both on Twitter as well as in a, on a video with Rich Cooper. After I did my Twitter threads, there was meant to be like a debate on Twitter space with the BBC guys. I was going to come and so on and so forth. After my uh, the Twitter threads, they dropped out because, again, they don't want to be held accountable for the, right. the words, which is, pro again, it shows the level of what journalism is now. In the past, journalism was that they used to hold the powers to account. And by holding the powers to account, we lived in a just and fair society. They made the, the Those who were, who were in power, the elite, made sure that they didn't infringe on our rights because they knew that journalists would hold them to account. But now there's a, basically an unholy alliance. And the problem with that is the people who suffer is the average person. Oh, yeah. L listen, I, I, I knew that when I used to read. Uh, I would, if, if you read, let's say, a, a, let's say the, the federal government releases a press release. And then when you go to the pre the next day, all they've done is taken the U.S. government's press release and rewritten it subtly. That's it. Yeah. Okay. You didn't talk to anybody. You didn't make any calls. You didn't go out and see these people. You didn't even, even on my own case, multiple articles were, we we reached out to Mr. Cox, but, uh, you know, he, he refused to comment or, but he was unavailable for comment. Like, nobody ever reached out to me. You could find me. I was incarcerated. It's easy to find me. And and I would see that over and over again. But, you know, overall in my in my own case, which was, you know, funny is that it was it, you know, it it was pretty fair. Right? Like I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't, you know, I'm not happy when they describe you as a certain way or say things, but you're like, eh, okay. But they weren't manufacturing things like yeah. the taint statements. And I've heard people say, He's a, I've heard that statement. He's a, a self-proclaimed misogynist. And I'm, and I'm like, you know, I've watched a lot of these videos and I've never heard him say that. Like, so what you just said makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of people that will tell me, oh, well, he says this and he does this. And I'm like, I've actually heard him say that that's not true. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm wondering where, oh, oh well, you can check the video. And I've had people in my comment section of my, of my videos and I've asked them, can you please send me a link to the video you're, you're, you know, you're speaking about? They never do. Yeah. I never get them. I never get follow up. Um, you know, and listen, and I get a lot of comments. I get, and I, and when people genuinely have, uh, when people genuinely have a, a an argument, they do follow up. They do email you. Yeah. They do send you the links. When they don't, and they're just spouting off, you know, nonsense. They tend to, they tend to, a lot of times they tend to insult you and then walk away. Yeah. Yeah. True. Not true. I was good. Um, well, I mean, listen, I, I appreciate you. I mean, unless you, you feel like you have any something, anything else. Um, no, that's everything. I think we covered everything in quite detail, actually. Okay. I, I, I really do appreciate, uh, you know, you speaking with me. Where are you located by the way? Um, I'm from the UK, uh, Yorkshire, but originally from the North. So hence my uh, accent. So I'm from Middlesbrough originally. You, have you heard of Newcastle? Yes. So I'm from near there. Okay. Um. All right. Do you know who Sean Atwood is? Yes. Okay. Um. I was going to say I actually I've been on his program a few times, and I, I actually I was just I went to um, shoot the Netherlands. It was um. Oh, Amsterdam. I went to Amsterdam like uh, last uh, last year, and he was irritated because he was like, he's like, well, why you were right there? You could have come by. We could have done a live interview. And I was like, I, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, listen, I really do appreciate you, you know, jumping on this uh, call with me, you know, this quickly. Thanks for having me. You know, I appreciate it. I appreciate the chance to have a conversation, and you came up with some such great points that I, I appreciate the clarification. I love a lot of points as well. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for doing this. And what I'll do is I'll, 
Do you have any any links that you want me to? I can put in the description and YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you my uh, Twitter link. Uh, okay. At, uh, Sheikh Suleiman, S H A Y K H S U L A I M A N, and my YouTube is the same. Although I'm planning to start that next week, but yeah, so they're my two links. Oh, you you don't have a you are you have a YouTube? Do you have anything? I've got a YouTube channel, but there's hardly any videos on there. I, I, I'm I'm going to do my setup on the weekend, so hopefully I'll start getting some videos out. Oh yeah, you gotta put you gotta put some videos out. Yeah, you have to. Like this is so much fun. Hey, especially. Yeah, I was gonna, especially with journalism, you know, in in general, just people they really do eat it up. Like they they love, it. especially if if they can tell that you're like, look, this is just. If you're not super biased, I think people people are 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 thirsty for someone that can just tell them the facts, as yeah. opposed to throwing this spin on everything. Yeah, true. Uh, so yeah, you definitely and and look if you. If you have anything and you want, you know, you want to come back on or once you get your channel up and running, if you want to do, you know, as a matter of fact, to be honest with you, by the time this comes up, you might already have stuff on your channel. So send me the link to your channel and I'll put the link to your channel in, uh, in the description also. Thank you. Thank you. I will do that. Um, definitely. Cause you got to get monetized as quick as possible. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I will do it. Thank you. All right. All right. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Yeah, definitely. Hey, so if you guys like the video, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Also, uh, like the video and share the video and leave me a comment if you guys want to, or if you guys have a, a different opinion or you want to yell at me or whatever the Whatever the case may be, by all means, leave me a comment. I try and respond to, I respond to probably nearly almost all the comments. I do have a bad day every once in a while, and I'll miss some of them. Uh, also, uh, I have Patreon. By all means, join my Patreon. And also, check out my book. Using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly, and quite luckily, avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the housing pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Bent is the story of John J. Boziak's phenomenal life of crime. Inked from head to toe, with an addiction to strippers and fast Cadillacs, Boziak was not your typical computer geek. He was, however, one of the most cunning scammers, counterfeiters, identity thieves, and escape artists alive and a major thorn in the side of the U.S. Secret Service as they fought a war on cybercrime. With a savant-like ability to circumvent banking security and stay one step ahead of law enforcement, Boziak made millions of dollars in the international cyber underworld with the help of the Chinese and the Russians. Then, leaving nothing but a John Doe warrant and a cleaned-out bank account in his wake, he vanished. Boziak's stranger-than-fiction tale of ingenious scams and impossible escapes of brazen run-ins with the law and secret desires to straighten out and settle down, makes his story a true crime con game that will keep you guessing. Bent, how a homeless teen became one of the cybercrime industry's most prolific counterfeiters. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Buried by the US government and ignored by the national media, this is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government. 
money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Services funds, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began work to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the US government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Pierre Rossini, in the 1990s, was a 20-something-year-old Los Angeles-based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed. A twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. Available on Amazon and Audible. Bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic conman against an egotistical pathological liar. Marcus Shrinker, the money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis, is about to be released from prison and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, The Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. Matthew B. Cox is a con man, incarcerated in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for a variety of bank fraud-related scams. Despite not having a drug problem, Cox inexplicably ends up in the prison's Residential Drug Abuse Program, known as RDAP, a drug program in name only. RDAP is an invasive behavior modification therapy specifically designed to correct the cognitive thinking errors associated with criminal behavior. The program is a non-fiction dark comedy which chronicles Cox's side-splitting journey. This first-person account is a fascinating glimpse at the survivor-like atmosphere inside of the government-sponsored rehabilitation unit. While navigating the treachery of his backstabbing peers, Cox simultaneously manipulates prison policies and the bumbling staff every step of the way. The Program How a Con Man Survived the Federal Bureau of Prisons' Cult of RDAP Available now on Amazon and Audible. If you saw anything you like, links to all the books are in the description box.